Take a deep breath. Relax. Let's go on a trip. Everyone, close your eyes. Deep breath. I'm going to take you into my first journey of sensory overload that changed my life. It's late afternoon in November, and you're driving up a mountain. You look out the window as the first change to pines. The sky is a deep blue, and the white tufts of clouds. As you round a corner, you see two children staring at your car, standing under those pines. The trees stand, but the village behind it doesn't. This is why you are here, because things have fallen. Take a deep breath. You're almost there. Then you take another deep breath, and this time you smell something unfamiliar. It is the stench of human flesh rotting under the debris. I didn't know what that was, but somehow, on a subconscious level, I recognized it. You can open your eyes. That was my first experience of natural disaster. The smell, the smell that those children were carrying on their bodies, the smell of their parents that will never come home to them that night. That is why we were there to help. To this day, when I think of that incident, I can still smell it. I can still feel it. I carry it with me. It is a part of who I am, and it made me who I am today, human. And that's what every disaster worker has: the smells, the chaos, something they bring back with them that defines who they become over the years. Let's think about the last 15 years and how many disasters have happened just in this region alone: the shootings, the bomb blasts, the earthquakes, the floods, the IDPs, the refugees. We've all been impacted in some way, haven't we? So, what do all of you do when you turn on the news and you hear of all of this? We start flipping through channels, looking at social media, looking for updates anywhere, everywhere. Then we start making calls. Who is going in? What organization can we donate to?、Um, what can we do? And then what happens? We give and we give, and we give to a point where we go numb. We can't give anymore. We start turning our faces away from that homeless beggar who's just asking for some spare change. We start.、Um, Ignoring the incessant ringing of the doorbell, knowing that there's a widow outside with five mouths to feed who just wants a little bit of food, we stop giving, we stop caring, we stop donating to floods and fires. That is compassion fatigue. Now imagine the disaster workers who are resilient enough to keep going in and helping people in any way that they can.、Um, Damage assessment,、uh, giving relief items, going and doing, helping the sick and injured. Imagine what they go through. They keep giving and giving. Just as an example, think about the last time a loved one was in the hospital. That one or two days where you had to be there taking care of them takes so much of a toll on us that we need a few days to recalibrate. Disasters impact all of us, everyone. No superhero is safe. When I came back from my first disaster,、um, I came back to university campus of students speaking about assignments and weekend plans and parties, and it was all so meaningless. How can people be sitting here? How can life continue like nothing had happened when entire villages had fallen, when there were homeless people on the streets, where? There were people buried under the debris, where children slept hungry under the sky. I didn't understand what was happening, and I reached out to my teachers. I tried to speak to people. It was a cry for help, and I tried to say that I am not okay.、Um, I'm a psychologist, by the way, so my teachers were also psychologists, but they didn't understand. They didn't get it.、Um, So I did what made the most sense to me at that point. I stopped talking about it. I shut down because if 
maybe there was something wrong in me if I could not readjust, right? So I tried to move on with my life. And that's what happens. See, compassion fatigue is different for everyone. Some people feel guilty, some people can't sleep. Um, it's a labor of love, so for some people, uh, it's sleeplessness or this need to go back and help more people. Whatever it is, it is important, and if not addressed, it causes mental health concerns. So, like I said, disasters affect all of us. The direct victims who were impacted, the communities, and the people who are going to help. What can be done? After my first intervention, I was told that just by going there and smiling and hearing people speak, I had made a difference. I was a student then, and I did not understand the importance or the meaning of psychological first aid, but that's all it is, listening. People like being heard. It allows them that time to process their thoughts and emotions, to grieve and to go through the process of catharsis. And it can help prevent so much. It can actually help prevent mental health complications. Having a supportive family is also very important. In 2015, when um, there was one disaster after the other, I quit my job to volunteer full-time to disasters. Having a family who understood that I could not sleep, I needed to take the next flight out, I needed to be there, I needed to help, really helped me bounce back better. Because it is a labor of love, and having love in your life really helps. <laughs> the team that you work with is also very instrumental, because they make you feel safe and cared for. And it is only when you feel safe and cared for that you can provide safety and care for others. So that is very important. So after the floods of 2010, there was a member of our team who wasn't reintegrating well. He was having problems sleeping, he stopped using air conditioning in the summers in Lahore. And um, he didn't use a bed. He decided that he wanted to volunteer all his spare time to our project. And his grades fell. So as a team, we took a decision, and once a week, we started going out for social outings, where we spoke about what we were going through, the things we had done in the field, the tangible interventions, and the intangible things we had done, like how we felt about what we were doing. Again, something so simple, but not only did it help his grades improve, it helped him uh, sleep better, it improved his relationship with his family, and he actually became more functional and better. <laughs> Alongside having support from everywhere, it's very important to take care of your own self, knowing and understanding the symptoms of compassion fatigue, monitoring yourself for them, taking care of your own simple needs. If you're hungry, eat. If you're tired, sleep. It's that simple, and that is all it takes. Uh, so for me, coming back from disaster, something very small that always made me feel good was lipstick. It is so simple, yet so effective, because it allowed me to feel beautiful and celebrate life, and celebrate how I looked. Or a mirror. The first time I saw a mirror after my first trip to the field, Ten days, I didn't realize I missed it. I didn't realize how important a mirror is until I saw my face and I realized I didn't recognize myself. And it made me think how grateful I am for these small things in life and how much there is that we take for granted on a daily basis. So in Pakistan, most interventions happen on a community level. It's people like our armed forces or people in uniform, uh, students or um, mosques, just general uh, us who go out and help. So what happens? We use our networks to go help others, but who's monitoring us? Who's taking care of our needs? Um, it's really important on a community level to start training in psychological first aid and start this dialogue where everyone knows what can or cannot go wrong. Um, when I went to Peshawar, after a particularly devastating incident in 
December 2014 that left over 140 children dead, we met this policeman, and he was not doing well. His take on the situation was that every act of terrorism, even acts of war, are dear to a certain level of honor. Wars and children to a place of education and killing innocent children is not something that is honorable or anything that a human being is capable of doing. That man could not adjust. He felt frustrated, he felt helpless, and he rightly so. But that was compassion fatigue. He was there to take care of us, and he just felt, how am I supposed to do this? That is why training people in psychological first aid and looking out for these signs and symptoms not only helps prevent certain mental health complications, but according to the World Health Organization, 50% of the world by 2020 will have some kind of mental health complication or need mental health interventions. So just starting this little dialogue with community leaders can actually help prevent a lot. So um, people keep asking me why I keep working in these regions despite the pressure, and um, it's not easy, right? So, again, in 2010, I was sitting after the floods with a few young girls, and we were talking about, I asked them what they wanted to be when they grew up. And they stared at me blankly. They didn't understand the question. They didn't understand that they could be anything that they wanted. Today, those same girls, um, a few of them have graduated high school. And... Thank you. It's one of the schools that we set up in that area, in Muzaffargarh. Um, and now when we ask them, what do you want to be? Some of them want to be doctors. One wants to join the army. They have dreams. And that is why we keep working, to allow people to have dreams, to get past the disaster, <laughs> to heal, to hope, to help themselves and to help the communities, and to be passionate about their lives. After my first intervention, I found myself back in a coaster, and again, driving down that mountainous road, I saw the, the pines change to firs, and I looked up at the sky, and I realized it was the first time in 10 days that I had looked around and saw how beautiful everything was. I didn't have time for any of that in 10 days, and that made me realize that this is what life is. It's not about seeking perfection in anything. It's about finding the silver linings, the little pockets of hope and sunshine, and taking them forward and sharing them with others for hope and for a better tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you very much.